You're listening to Barbell Logic, brought to you by Barbell Logic Online Coaching, where each week we take a systematic walk through strength training and the refining power of voluntary hardship. You're listening to the Barbell Logic Podcast. This is Matt Reynolds. I'm here with Chris. This is another Principles episode. Happy Sunday to you. And today, we're going to talk about the value of admitting your mistakes, being able to take personal responsibility. And, and taking your personal responsibility um, certainly is a far broader topic than just admitting mistakes. So we want to hone in on this one right now. But this has been something that I have noticed has been very much a pervasive and important um, thing in my life, something that's had a dramatic positive impact in my life. Uh, there are lots of things we'll talk about on this show that are principles that I struggle with, things like radical self-honesty and, and you know things like that, that we've talked about in the past. Um, for whatever reason, it, especially in my later life, say in the past 10 years, it doesn't bother me to admit my mistakes. And what I have found is that it makes my life easier. And so I just want to flesh that out a little bit, what that looks like, and talk about the kind of psychology behind it. And so, um, what do you what do you think when I when I said that and I presented that topic to you, like, hey, let's talk about this? What were the first couple of things that came to mind? The first thing that I think about when I think about admitting your mistakes is that it follows your own maturity path in life. I think, uh, and I you know I know this from at least my younger kids that they really struggle with admitting mistakes that they've made. And it's not because of a culture in our house of not being able to say you were wrong, because I say it all the time, and, and so does my wife. I actually just think that there's something to the, to the um, uh, your own self-confidence. Uh, it takes a lot of self-confidence to be able to admit that you were wrong, um, that you made a mistake, and to recognize that that mistake is not a bad thing in life. In fact, they are amongst the best things in life. Yep. Um, we, we learn so much more from mistakes than we do from <laughs> doing something well. Um, and, uh, and so I think that as, as most people that I know who are good at this got good at it over time as they got older, as they gained confidence in themselves and what they were doing, uh, they got to where they were able to admit their mistakes because they recognized that it was it was in coming to terms with their mistakes that they became better. Yeah, yeah, it's good. I, I you pulled all kinds of great points out of that. Let's let's start with the immaturity factor. I think for our kids and and for ev really everyone, it's we're sort of it's sort of in our instinct to not admit mistakes out of I think self preservation. Mm -hmm. I think for kids, they're trying to preserve self. They're trying. They're like. Yeah. And so it's interesting because you can reason with them when you catch them in a in a deep mistake and be like, "Buddy, just it's okay. Just tell you know, just tell me." Like, there's been no pattern of behavior that says that if you say you're sorry and admit that you're wrong, that I'm going to beat you to death. We've never done that. Yeah. That's that that's not what we do here. So there's so it's interesting because there's no pattern of behavior that says that if you admit you're wrong, then bad things happen to you in this household. As a matter of fact, it's almost always the opposite in my household. We celebrate the fact that, man, that's very mature that you were able to see that right. and learn from that thing, right? And so and so we celebrate that. Now, interestingly enough, I think that, unfortunately, many people never grow out of that immaturity. And they continue to make it this sort of thing that's about self-preservation. I think it's also about pride and it's often about stubbornness and, and, the, and it's, you know, especially as you get old enough to understand what those things are. But I still think there's this self-preservation piece. And one of the things I thought, I've thought about for guys like you and me, and I know many of our listeners, I've said before, I don't know if I've said it on the show, that I, I dislike awkward conversations and confrontations as much as the next guy. I can't stand it. But I'm forced to have them all the time. I've been forced to have them. I had to have them as a teacher. I, and of course, exponential increases in owning business and being a father. And what I found is that when I'm able to admit my mistakes, when I'm able to be transparent, when I'm able to be vulnerable, when I'm able to actually identify that, you know, daddy screwed up or, um, or Matt Reynolds, the, 
the owner of this business, made a mistake. It's actually incredibly freeing. When I hold on to the mistake and, and, and refuse to admit it, I feel like it holds me in bondage to it, right? Like, I've planted my flag. I'm, I had to make that mistake, but deep down in your soul, you know you did, right? Well, you're absolutely damned to make the same mistake over and over again if you can't confront it. And that's so right. I, that, that's exactly right. I also think that you have, there's an aspect of this that's even more important for people who are in really any kind of leadership type position. And I'm not just talking about in, in business. I mean, parents too. You know, you, you want your kids to be comfortable making mistakes and growing from them. And you as a parent are unwilling to admit when you make mistakes, uh, guess what? <laughs> yeah. You know, you're, I mean, like, so, and the same is true if you're a boss. If you're a boss and you're, you're the boss that can never say I was wrong, you're not going to find a lot of your employees coming around going, ah, man, I really, I really screwed right. up on this one. And, and, uh, and this is what I learned from it. Uh, you know, part of the thing that has to come out of this is, in the, I don't know if this term is used very frequently outside of the DevOps world, which is a, a, an area of technology that I'm, I'm used to, but this idea of the postmortem, which is when, you know, a bad mistake has occurred, some sort of incident has occurred, and you need to go back and you need to examine as a company why it happened and make sure that you design and modify systems and processes so that it doesn't occur again. And uh, over the last probably five or 10 years, that, that phrase actually became a blameless postmortem. So you would get all the people into the room that were involved in fixing whatever it was, whatever the incident was. But there's a very clear protocol, which is that we're never pointing fingers at people and screaming at them for it. Because what we want is open honesty about, you know what? I did this thing, I followed this process and, um, Maybe I cut a corner, maybe I didn't. Either way, the process needs to be modified so that this doesn't happen again. Sure. So this is this whole idea of learning from your mistake in the process. Sure. Yeah, and on top of that, obviously, you've now mentioned twice that we learn far much more from our mistakes than we do from our, our, our good decisions, our, our correct decisions. But I think it goes even further than that. You know, I believe that I am able to have a far better teachable moment with my kids, with my staff, and with whoever, when I'm able to admit my own mistakes. So it's not just about let me teach you and model how to do things right. It's let me teach you and model how to take responsibility for when you do something wrong. Yeah. Not to point fingers at them because they're doing something wrong, but because I'm modeling that, you know what? I had my head up my hind end right there. Yep. That was not okay. Like, I, can't, you know, there have been many times where I've, let's be practical and honest for a second. Like, there have been many times, and I'm sure... You have similar stories, although after going through our personalities, probably less than me, that I have taken out anger on my kids or my wife, having nothing to do with my kids or my wife, entirely to do with stress in the business. Now, let me be clear. When I say anger, I don't mean I'm screaming and throwing stuff through the window or beating people, but it's just, you know, you just, you respond in a way that's less than kind. Like maybe you even yell or you curse or whatever that thing is. And, right. and then later you're like, that, that didn't have anything to do with them. I was in a bad place because I was stressed because of this thing that happened. So then to go back to them and say, hey, listen, when daddy got mad a little while ago, that had nothing to do with you. That is entirely on me. It wasn't okay. Right? It's not fair to you for me to take that out on you. And I'm really, really sorry. I love you so much. Like nothing's changed in the way I feel about you. And I'm, I'm really, really sorry that I responded that way. And then you can see the teachable moment. You can see the you know, their eyes get bright and a lot of times their, their eyes will well up with a little bit of tear because they thought that they did something wrong and that's why right. you were mad at them. Oh yeah, yeah. But they didn't. Man, the, the introvert's version of that is not, it doesn't show out the same way, but it does have the same exact effect. And that is for me, um, when I get particularly stressed or when I'm really maybe starting to border just a little bit on getting a little bit of depression, uh, which happens to me, I get super, super quiet. I go right into my brain and I'm trying to solve things and I'm having arguments with people in my mind. Sometimes I'm thinking about something from about every perspective in my head that I can. 
and I ignore the world around me. And so my kids and my wife will sometimes be like, why are you so distant? You know, and eventually I come out, I'm, you know, I'm not done with it. I'm still working on it, sure. that, that type of thing. But I mean, I get pretty quiet to the point that when people talk to me, I often don't respond. And sometimes I didn't even hear them. Uh, and my wife has worked with me on just telling everybody what's going on in my head. Hey, daddy's got a thing I'm working through in my mind. I'm going to be really distracted for a little while. It's nothing about you. But, um, you know, I, I need a little bit of time to process this and think through it. And that's, you know, that's what's going on. And so it is the same type of thing. I, I don't typically lash out with anger. I'm just totally silent. <laughs> I become sure I become a rock sitting in a, in a, in a chair somewhere and nobody knows why I'm uh, despondent. So no, it's good. Another extremely important piece of this that I have found is that the value that it has for conflict resolution, right? So if I if I am in a conflict with a member of my family or a member of my staff, or maybe it's, you know, an issue with a client or anything in the business, and and there's conflict or things go bad, even when it is pretty clear, or even maybe abundantly clear that the other person is primarily in the wrong. Here's what I know. I can't control what they do. Yep. I don't have any power on what they do. So anytime that something bad happens to me involving a relationship or a conflict in in family and business and whatever, the first question I ask is, what role did I play in this? And the answer is always something. Yeah, something. It Absolutely. is almost never. Yeah. And uh, like as a as a what well, even, you know, as a as a dad and someone who sees himself as the head of the household, and I'm not talking about any of this, I'm I'm certainly in a hierarchy over my kiddos, right? My wife and I are very much it's pretty egalitarian in in my life. And the same thing in the business, right? There are times that those things happen, and when I can then say, Well, now hold on. I'm the one that really sets the rules here in the in the family, in the household. I'm the one that helps set the culture. And so if this thing happened because my kid did something, I still had some role to play in that. Yep. Right. And right. The, and it's far more true in the business. Like when something happens in the business, somebody makes a decision that I feel like is a selfish or a wrong decision. I don't have a discussion with them to try to get them to admit what they did wrong. I actually want to resolve the conflict and far preferably to reconcile the relationship. And that requires me to admit my wrongdoing or my narrow sightedness, or I was laser focused on this and completely missed this thing over here that kind of caused that problem. And what I found is that it immediately, 90 plus percent of the time, tears down the walls of the other person so that it then makes it far easier and a, and a much lower barrier to entry for them then to say, you know what, I played a role in this too. Here's the key. I have zero expectation that they're ever going to say anything like that. Yeah, you can't you can't have it or else it doesn't work. <laughs> you know, you think about the, the the funnest one to talk through there is like your when you have marital conflict, right? And it's if there's marital conflict, you're both at fault. G guarantee, Every right? Time. What percentage doesn't even matter. Everybody's at fault a little bit. The spouse that goes to the other spouse and says, "Honey, I am really sorry for the uh, for the part I played in that. Um, you know, would you forgive me?" and now, do you have something you need to say back to me? <laughs> that does not go well. No, that last sentence has that to be. That is not a, that is not, and not even, never you know, spoken. obviously that not just verbalizing it, but even, even having the internal expectation of that, the idea is not to set the other person free. The idea is to set me free. Hmm. Honestly, I could actually say that in many mistakes on some level, there's a little bit of actual self-preservation, narcissism, and like, I don't want to hold on to the guilt of the thing that I did wrong. And so, and that even, that even for the listeners of the podcast who listen all these years, I've made some really terrible choices, big time choices in my life over the past 40 years. Things have affected my family negatively or affected my kids negatively or affected, whatever. I've hurt people, you know? And and as a, as a guy that's kind of out there and is fairly public with the podcast and with the business, what I want to do is I want to be able to run away from those things and I want to hide them. But then it just eats me up inside. And it's far easier for me 
to just like, I'm not going to go air the details of my dirty laundry out to the podcast, but to be able to say like, look, I used to be a really shitty husband to my wife and I'm so grateful that we've been able to come through that. My marriage is stronger than it's ever been. Like that's freedom to me. That's not bondage. The other way is bondage. And then I feel like, oh, oh God, I'm hiding. I'm pretending to be this thing. I'm pretending to be the wonderful husband, the wonderful father, the wonderful boss, the wonderful business owner, the whatever. And I'm, and I'm not all the time. And so there's freedom in me for me to be able to admit those mistakes. I think there's a there's an aspect to all of this. I think that under underlies much of of the conversation we're having that mistakes are bad and you don't want to make them. And I actually think that idea in and of itself needs to be completely tore down. Sure. The unfortunately, I think some of that has made it to our children, um to our generation's children especially uh, who are terrified of making mistakes, who won't, you know, in a, she's like a, a classic, uh, uh, education, public education room or something, won't raise their hand and, and answer a question that they think they might be wrong about because the embarrassment of being wrong is so much yeah. worse than the value of being right. Um, and if you look at any, uh, entrepreneur in the world that made a big dent in anything, they will cite that failure over and over and over were the main contributors to their long-term success. That's right. There's this quote that Michael Jordan, I'm going to use him because everybody's watching the ESPN special right now. Yeah. <laughs> if you're not, it's pretty good. It's real good. Uh, but he said, uh, I've missed more than 9,000 shots in my career. I've lost almost 300 games. 26 times I've been trusted to take the game-winning shot and missed. I've failed over and over and over again in my life, and that is why I succeed. Yep. And I think when you look at somebody like Michael Jordan, and you, you, what you realize is you have to get, uh, by the way, that is not an endorsement uh, to be like Mike. Uh, right. <laughs> <laughs> when I walk away from the ESPN special, I go, man, I'm glad I'm not like Mike. That's but right. uh, props to Michael Jordan, uh, who's not listening to this. Anyway, the whole point is failure in life is literally the thing that you learn from. And they yeah. are, I, in some ways, I think, I think about failures and uh, mistakes as those things along our path that were always going to be there. Um, so if you could see your entire life, you know, as like maybe a big, long trail that you had to get down the the failures and mistakes along the way you always were going to hit one way or the other the question is do you hit it and fall over and stop right or do you do you move on uh learn from the mistake and go hit the next one sure well, because hey, to make it to the end you got to hit them all why do we why do we do things like really hard linear progression squats right because at some point we're going to fail that's right and we have to learn how to grind and we have to learn how to persevere. We have to learn how to do the voluntary hardship thing. And that's it's that's the reason that he, here's a thing again that is not moral or immoral. It's it's lifting weights, right? Um, but it carries over so well to the rest of our life. And and by the way, I I think most of the the things you were bringing up right there, those mistakes. So many people struggle with admitting mistakes when they are amoral mistakes. They they were. You made the best decision at the time that you knew how, and it was yeah. wrong. Yeah. It wasn't immoral. It wasn't in the Judeo-Christian sense of the word, a sin, right? It wasn't something that was like malicious or depraved or evil. It was it was a mistake. It was yeah. often an accident, right? And, and that happens all the time. As a matter of fact, the vast majority of mistakes that I've made in business, I look back now in hindsight of 2020 and be it 2020, also in the year 2020, and look back and say, this I would have done differently. But at the yeah. time, I did the best that I knew how. There are many people that struggle with making, with admitting those things. And I think that's maybe, that's a great first step, right? Uh, it could literally be as simple as, I'm sorry, I, I, I burnt the breakfast. Or I made a mistake. Like, yeah. I, you didn't mean to burn the breakfast. You didn't burn the breakfast on purpose. You didn't burn the breakfast because you hated the person you were serving it to. Like, none of those things are, are reality. And what is there to lose in admitting that you burnt the breakfast? I mean, that's that's a minor thing. Yeah. But I actually think there's real value 
to admitting your mistakes at some level to the people who have been affected or could be affected by those mistakes, even when most of us would place some amount of morality or immorality behind those mistakes, right? And I re- we're all over the board on like what what is moral and immoral, what? But you know, like we, you and I have talked about this before, like with our kids and and like language, right? Like there are curse words that's just part of the vernacular now. You know, we have people listen to this podcast once every two months. We get an email like, boy, I sure do wish, like, I sure would like to let my kids listen to your podcast, but just a little too much, a uh, little too much language in there. I'm like, I absolutely get it, you know, but we are who we are, right? And so in our generation, it seems to be acceptable by most, and I realize that there are going to be people listening to this that cringe, that our generation just kind of drops the F word sometimes in normal vernacular, and we don't consider it evil. If we said that in front of Grandpa Lynn, he would he would not be happy at all, right? True. Now, there are ways to use the F word that are clearly mean-spirited towards other people. And that's the difference, right? Like, so you can say, you know, maybe I shouldn't have said, maybe I shouldn't have said the F word on the Barbara Logic podcast as a mistake because I just sounded like white trash dropping a curse word when it didn't really need to be there versus there are times when I've told people, hey, you go F yourself. That's not the same thing, right? (laughs) There is an actual, there's an actual, like, I'm trying to degrade and disrespect that person. Both, I think, are extremely valuable to be able to admit your stakes and mistakes and and take responsibility for. Now, you are probably not ever going to be like me in that you would broadcast any major mistakes that have hurt people in your life on the podcast. But I do know, as you know, one of my best friends, if not my best friend and my little brother, that you are able to admit those mistakes to the people that you've hurt or when it affects them. When you make decisions that are selfish or self-centered or, you know, not, it doesn't take into consideration other people's feelings. And I think that, man, it's so important. And so for me, I learn from those mistakes. I model teaching. I have a better opportunity to teach when I admit those mistakes. And for me, it's an enormous sense of relief that I don't have to bear the burden of those mistakes of my past on my shoulders. And so that's a huge principle in my life. Totally agree. Anything else? I don't think so. I mean, look, here's the thing. Everybody makes mistakes regularly. Everybody knows people who can't admit that they make mistakes, and no one likes those people. So if nothing else, at least take the step of not being that person, and then maybe over time grow to the point where you recognize and you maybe see your mistakes as being those mistakes you literally were always going to hit on your path of growth in life uh, so that you don't see the mistake as even a bad thing. You see it as this great opportunity for growth uh, because it it is just, there is no better form of learning than making a mistake. Yep. Agreed. So that that's it. Admit your mistakes. That's a big principle for both of us. And you can see how both an extrovert and an introvert do it. You have been listening to the Barbell Logic podcast, our principle series on Sundays, where we talk about all those important things in life that will uh, certainly bleed into the gym and into, uh, you'll see a lot of those principles and culture of what we do in the gym and at Barbell Logic uh, in those principles, but they often deal with things like family, business, relationships, um, so on and so forth, knowledge, reading. And so uh, come and hang out. I hope you are enjoying the principal series that we do on Sunday. And we will see you tomorrow for a content episode.